Being loved as the very one you are is something that many of us didn't get as children, leaving us feeling worthless to the core. In this episode, you'll see how your infancy needs were not met and how this affects your adult life. By using meditations, affirmations, and guided imagery, you'll journey back in time to reclaim your weakest and most helpless self, thus catapulting you toward wholeness and increased personal power. Welcome to the show, folks. I want to talk now about reclaiming our inner infant. Uh, in a previous program, I talked about original pain, and we talked about heavy, intense feeling work. Uh, that kind of work is not for everyone. Uh, it depends on the kind of abuse, the extent of the abuse that people have gone through. There are other ways for us to do this original pain reclaiming our inner child work. And uh, in this program, I want to show you one of the ways that I do it in my workshops, uh, where we talk about helping people to welcome, be welcome to the world and reclaim the infant child that we once were. There are people who were not welcome to the world, uh, who did not feel welcome to the world. And uh, it's a very sad kind of thing for someone to come into the world and not be welcome to the world. Uh, I want to talk about how wonderful children are, uh, how precious they are. I mean, think about a little child you've seen uh, at, at some time in your life where you just wanted to go see him again. It's like they're, they're so fascinating, they're so fantastic. Uh, and there's just something unique about every child. And of course, as parents, we always think, our kid is beautiful, uh, even though others may not. Uh, we think that this is the most beautiful child we've ever seen. Hopefully we do. There are people who are born whose moms and dads do not think that. I I've quoted this a lot, but this is one of my favorite poems. And I first heard Buckminster Fuller quote this. It is by Christopher Marley, this poem. And the poem says, the greatest poem ever known is one all poets have outgrown. The poetry innate, untold, of being only four years old. Barn comrade of bird, beast, and tree, and unself-conscious as the bee, still young enough to be a part of, great, of nature's great impulsive heart. And yet with lovely reason skilled, each day new paradise to build elate explorer of each sense, without dismay, without pretense, in your unstrained, transparent eyes, there is no conscience, no surprise. Life's queer conundrums you accept, your strange divinity still kept. And life that sets all things in rhyme may make you poet too in time. But there were days, O oh tender elf, when you were poetry itself. And that's true of every single one of us. We come into the world and we're poetry itself. We're this little bunder of wonderfulness. We're full of wonder. The world is brand spanking new. And, and all we want really is a chance. And unfortunately, so much of our early life depends on who our parents are and the state of our parents, their, their mental health. Uh, I've been drawing these little people on here, uh, people that are adult children. And uh, I've been showing you how, for example, this person uh, 
may have a wounded child inside of them so that they look like an adult, they talk like an adult, they walk like an adult, but there's a little child inside who never got his or her developmental needs met. And suppose they have a little child. Suppose they have a little child. It's going to be very difficult for this needy, unfinished, dependent child inside this adult to be able to take care of this child. How many children do you know who would like to take care of another child? Uh, you know, or think of when you were a little kid and you had to take care of your little brother or your little sister. So this little baby comes into the world just full of wonder, full of all the, uh, the magnificent traits of, of being a wonderful little child. Uh, this little baby uh, has a sense of wonder. The world is brand new. It's exciting. Everything is to be explored. Let's eat it. Let's smell it. Uh, let's taste it. Uh, in another program, we're going to talk about that early exploratory stage of the toddler uh, and how if you didn't get your needs met in that stage, you may have a hard time initiating things or, or when you go to a new place, it'll be hard for you to venture out. Uh, I write about uh, being, uh, being at a port in La Havre, France last year and my daughter, my stepdaughter, who's just this wonder, still has this wonder child. And she said, uh, let's, let's, don't, you know, let's don't go on the cruise bus to Paris. Uh, let's take the train. We can get there an hour early. And I go, okay. Uh, and then all night I lay there tossing and turning, <laughs> fantasizing that maybe the train will derail, maybe it won't be on time. And then the ultimate fantasy is it won't get back and the ship will leave without us. <laughs> These are my abandonment fears coming out. And uh, it, it turned out I didn't go. I didn't go with her on the, tr uh, on the train. Uh, I, I, I barely slept that night worrying about the train. <laughs> you see this sense of wonder and exploring and you're in a place, let's go look and let's go touch and taste and smell and sensory acuity. Children have this sensory acuity. They really see and they see colors and uh, they touch and taste. And, you know, people then have to, uh, if you don't get to maintain those traits of the child, uh, m most of us get numbed out. We don't see what we see. We don't hear what we hear. We don't feel what we feel. We don't smell what we smell. And when we talk about championing the child, I'm going to show you some exercises you can do to work on getting back to that. So this sense of wonder, the world is brand new every day. Uh, everything is interesting. Remember in Zarba, the, the movie where he says, look at the dolphin, look, look at the dolphin. He's out of his gourd over a dolphin. Uh, and he's just all excited and he's jumping up and down like a child. Or, or like when you first went to the zoo to th see things. Uh, the children are optimistic. Now these very traits go both ways. Uh, children have a natural sense of trusting their environment because they have a natural sense of I amness. I talked about the spiritual wound in an earlier program. Uh, that sense of I am who I am. And children are born with that organismic sense of I am who I am. I can remember my son at an early age uh, you know, when we were going out real young, who's going to take care of me? You know, he's going to, boy, I mean, he's got this sense of I, I'm very important and who's taking care of me? Have you worked that out yet? Before we go on with these plans, uh, let's be sure someone's taking care of me. Uh, so, uh, naivete, this is why children can be so terribly hurt with abuse because they are naive and they are trusting and you know, for example, in certain kinds of sexual abuse, where it feels good to a child, and yet there's a fear, and yet there's an outcry at some level. Like I've seen a lot of people from dysfunctional families who are addicted to fear, and they confuse fear and excitement. Uh, they confuse fear and excitement because growing up, they, that, that naivete, they were violated. And then children have are naturally dependent. This is one of the basic problems is that for six or seven years, we are the most dependent of all animals for our developmental needs. 
We, we simply can't get our needs met. Uh, I, I would say one of the goals of life is personal power. Personal power means that I have control over my life. I, I reasonably, can reasonably predict what I'm going to do with my life. Joseph Campbell talked about that as finding your bliss, doing what you want with your very own life, and knowing where you're going with your very own life. That's personal power. A child is powerless. A child is dependent. The needs of a child are dependency needs. What that means is that the child is dependent on this person to get his or her needs met. They are deficiency needs that you can't get them met. As adults, we can get our needs met. Now, it may be hard sometimes, but we, we have the power to do it. A child does not. So I'm going to talk a lot about the neglect of developmental dependency needs and that this is one of the reasons uh, children are so, so vulnerable to abuse, to any kind of abuse in that first six or seven years. Uh, and one of the things that happens when children are shamed, because we're going to talk in a minute about the bond that is established in a healthy infancy, the mirroring, echoing, trusting bond that comes through touching and holding, uh, when that bond is broken through toxic shame, through, through hitting, through screaming, through whatever the abuse is, when that bond is broken, one of the things that happens is that we quit believing that we can depend on anybody. In my own recovery from my own alcoholism, it took me 14 months to be able to make a year in a 12-step program for alcoholism. And, and I wouldn't call anybody. People were giving me their phone numbers. They were saying, you know, I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you. But you see, that, that shame base in me, I didn't believe that I had the right to depend on anybody. Because once those dependency needs are broken in your life, you quit believing that you can depend on anybody. Uh, emotions. Children are emotional. I, I've talked in a previous program about the primacy of emotion, that the emotional brain, the tripartite brain, we have, a, we have a visceral brain, an emotional brain, and a thinking brain. And these brains develop. Many think they recapitulate the evolutionary process. This is the reptilian brain. And it's very much the visceral brain uh, uh, concerned with instinct. It's very much concerned with repetition. A lizard's deal is going out every morning, eating a few mosquitoes, getting home without getting eaten yourself. When he does that, he's had a good day. <laughs> and he will never forget the path. So, so your reptilian brain is the part of you that will not go on the freeway. I've always gone home this way, and I'm going to continue to go home this way. Uh, it takes an hour longer, but I'm not getting on that freeway. The emotional brain. So chill, and, and we have two emotions. We weep. Human beings weep. Other animals cry. They don't weep. They don't shed tears. Fry and his associate found chemicals, hormones in tears that reduce stress. So it's very important for brain chemistry to be able to be emotional, to be able to weep. And it's weeping that draws us to a child. Uh, and nature provides children with loud voices, uh, <laughs> very loud voices. I mean, here I am, a child advocate sitting on an airplane the other day. I'd have thrown this kid out, I think. Uh, I've never heard a child with such a loud voice. Uh, and it's it just, I mean, boy, they get your attention. And, uh, uh, and the other emotion we have is laughter. Weeping and laughter. And the other emotion we have that no other animal have is shame. Healthy shame. So these are specifically human emotions that all children have. Uh, resilience. Uh, I watched a little film that uh, Ashley Montague, who wrote a wonderful book called Growing Young, and I'm going to talk about that in a later program, what he calls neotomy, the childlike traits, and how the most power, the, 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 the civilizations he's studied that have survived the longest are those that have these childlike tra traits, maintain childlike traits. Uh, but he talks, he, he shows this little five minute film of this child trying to get up on a couch, kid keeps falling down. Just keeps climbing back up, keeps falling down, keeps climbing back up, finally gets up there. And uh, pretty proud of herself, or I can't remember, it's a little boy, a little girl, but then a dog comes in the room. 
kid looks the dog over, gets down off the couch, and the dog kind of nudges the child, and the child goes, bah! <laughs> See, now that's courage. Uh, <laughs> and children naturally have courage. Rudolf Dreikers talks about all misbehaving children are discouraged children. Children who had the courage, the heart. See, core ego is to have heart. So children have heart and they love to play and playing is a way that they accommodate and assimilate. They play, a broom becomes a little horsey. Now, you know, some of us have lost the capacity to play. And when we talk about championing your inner child, I, I'm going to talk about new rules and new permissions that you give yourself. And one of them is the permission to play. And, and you can, you know, you can pl play all you can. There, there's no limit on this. Nobody's got a time limit that says you played long enough. See, because in, in the system I was brought up in, if you were having a great time, they would look at their watches. I think we've had enough fun. <laughs> I think it's time now. Two minutes, you know, I'm right into it. I'm just getting rolling. See, so I used alcohol. I used drugs as a way to be able to play. When I sobered up, I went to a dance, I could hardly move my buttocks. Uh, I, was so, I was so muscle bound and, and numbed out. You know, it's like, okay, let me. but a few drinks and I'm up on the table dancing. You know, and, and so it's real important. Uniqueness, that there's no, no, no two people are alike. There's no two thumbprints alike. We're utterly unique. You could go back a million years, you'd never find anybody like you. 10 million years. Every little baby is unique, and we need to maintain that uniqueness. See, what's the difference that makes the difference? And I'm going to show you in this program and other programs just how important it is to embrace that child within yourself. That, you know, like I have an exercise I do, and I have people see somebody they love come in the room, and, oh, they feel all tingly and excited. And I say, see yourself walk in the room. <laughs> And people start going, oh, God, you know, look, look at that gut. Look at, you know, uh, but, but I say, see a child walk in the room. The room. See, see a little child walk in the room, the child you once were. Oh, and we can do better with that. Most people can really do better with that. So one of the ways we're going to reconnect with ourselves is to reclaim this child, this child that lives in us. See, what Walt Disney understood better than anybody is that while there's very little adult and a child, there's an enormous amount of child in every adult. Uh, if you don't believe that, go to Disneyland. Uh, the first time I went there, there was 40 adults to every kid. And I'm going, where are the kids here? You know, well, well all the kids were there. Uh, so, uh, and this little child is naturally loving. I, I think that we have this life spark, and this life spark moves toward what Nietzsche called Ubermensch overcoming, expanding, that life is always trying to expand itself. We're always becoming. See, uh, in one of the previous programs, Original Pain, in the program where I talked about the wounded inner child, I talked about the, the reenactment cycles, that you keep acting out the cycles, and, and, and see, you act out the scenes, the, the scenes of abuse, because a child gets those scenes imprinted in their brain. And so you'll keep picking a person who's abusive. You get picking, uh, keep picking a person who was like that parent that abused you. Uh, but, but at one level, that's also a positive thing, even though it's painful and destructive. It's the child trying to work it out. It's the life spark trying to complete the past, trying to finish it. See, so if I can, I, okay, but well this guy is going to be just like dad, but this time, this time I'm going to be perfect, I'm going to be loving, or, or this time I'm going to be with this woman and she's not going to engulf me. Uh, she's going to be there and she's going to nurture me and she's going to be, be nourishing. But, but what? I, I, this little child doesn't have a self, so, so the wounded inner child keeps picking the same kind of person, keeps picking out the same kind of person. Now, this infant... This infant child, when he or she comes into the world, has very specific needs. And the most important need, your, your infancy needs came up when you walked in this, well, uh, this theater. That is, it's, if you have never been here before, those of you who have never been here before, your infancy needs came up because it was a brand new place. And what you needed to hear 
as you needed to hear when you came to the world is welcome to the world. Welcome to the theater. We're really glad you're here. We, we will take care of you as best we can while you're here. Everything's going to be okay. See, that, that's what we needed to hear when we came into the world. And we needed a face that when we looked at that face, this mothering face, that when I looked up at that face, every part of me was reflected back. So when I looked up, these are what are called mirroring needs, echoing needs. Child needs to look into that face and have unconditional positive regard. Now the fact that probably none of us got that perfectly doesn't mean we still didn't deserve it. That any child born to man, woman, deserves that unconditional love. That, 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 you know, the parenting is the hardest job anybody's going to ever do. We really need to be prepared for it. You need a lot more than a blood test to do this job. <laughs> and uh, as I've said many times, we allow a 15-year-old to do it uh, with, without any training whatsoever. We give a person operating the telephone more training than we do a mom and a daddy for the hardest job that they will ever do in their life. Now, one, there is a, you know, there's a kind of a happy sign that people are waiting later to have children. They're, they're, they're becoming more prepared to have children, realizing what a responsibility is. And, and I want to underscore it that this, you know, this work that I do is not about bashing parents. It's not about blaming parents. Blaming is just to cover up for shame. Well, that's not what it's about. It's about accountability, though. It's about finding out what really happened to us because you cannot heal something unless you know what it is. Nothing changes until it becomes real. And if you didn't get your developmental dependency needs met, you better know it. So, so like the courage of those people that were sharing in the program we did on original pain, you're going to see some people in this program sharing. Their courage and their honesty, I'm very indebted to these people because it may encourage you and others, people watching, to demythologize their parents and to accept the truth of their childhood. That probably none of us have gotten the kind of needs met that we, we need to have. I can't imagine anybody coming out of that. This kid couldn't possibly get these needs met. This kid that has this mirroring face to look up into. This kid can't possibly get these needs met because mama's an adult child herself. At some level, suppose mother didn't get her infancy needs met. These are called your narcissistic needs. What does that mean? It means that like Narcissus who looked in the mirror and saw his face and fell in love with himself, every baby has a right to, to have reflected back that every part of me is okay. Every part of me is okay. See, if I look in that face and, and my anger is rejected, then my anger is over here. So I am beside myself with anger. I am beside myself. One part of me is over here and my anger is over there. Or when you're in little pink ribbons, or you're in little corduroy, or little velvet suits, you're adorable. But then you potty on yourself. <laughs> Not so adorable. We have to be able to look in that face and have every part reflected back. Otherwise, those parts split off. And then we start projecting those onto other people. Or they become more and more primitive. That is, they're not part of me. I'm not integrated. I'm not self-accepted. So I have these parts of myself that I don't accept. And, and, and then it may be anger, and that anger over the years becomes rage. It becomes more and more primitive. That's what happened to me. I was never allowed to have my anger. It was one of the seven deadly sins. When I went to Catholic school, Sister Ida passed actual pictures of hell around the room. <laughs> we don't know where she got them, but uh, my buddy and I thought she was there and, and had made a deal with the devil to come torment us. Now, she was a wonderful woman, Sister Ida, and she, I'm not blaming her either. She thought this is a way to scare the hell out of us. And believe me, it did. Uh, but, but it was sort of a, the idea at the time that this is the way you get kids to behave. But what happened is that all that rage was never mirrored back. And so 
Uh, the, the other thing a child needs to know is that I can trust the world, that the world is trustworthy, that you will be there for me, and I can have hope that I can get my needs met. See, when, if, if this child who is needy, this child is needy by nature, not by choice, it has a mother who has a needy child, what's going to happen when that kid's needy? I'll tell you what happens to most kids in dysfunctional families when they're needy. They don't get their needs met. The parent gets angry. I, I would be willing to bet, if you're from a dysfunctional family, that when you were the neediest, that's when you got shamed the most. When you most needed a compassionate adult to hold you and be there for you. Because what you did is you triggered the neediness in this parent. Now, I, I have some indexes of suspicion that I use. Did you get your infancy needs met? Uh, ingestive addictions like overeating. You want to see eating disorders in the make? Watch. Here's mama. Here's a little baby crying. Stick something in their mouth. Here's the way to solve that. Eat your, eat your sadness. Eat your, eat your anger. So we're learning from very early ages to eat our feelings and not to feel the feelings. Those of you that saw the original pain program, uh, Kip is right there encouraging Jim who's working, who says it's so painful. His inner child says it's so painful. Kip says, that's good. Be a good daddy. Just let him have his pain. Let him have his pain. Let him have his sadness. Don't, don't discount him by taking it away from him. Let's look on the bright side. Uh, taking the pain away so you can't connect with yourself. Mistrust of people because trust is the most important issue for this child. That I can trust the world. Einstein on his deathbed said, there's only one important question, and that is, is the universe friendly? That's an awful important question. <laughs> And see, every child coming in the world has got to figure out, is this crowd, is this a friendly place? When I come in here, is this a safe, friendly place? So mistrust of people, which will come out in the need to control, out of touch with physical needs. Like sometimes I hit a bed, I don't even know how tired I am. Somebody asked me on a TV show recently, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? And I thought for a minute... And I thought, my gosh, I've hardly ever been in my body. <laughs> <laughs> Alcoholism isn't about thirst. Uh, and eating addictions are not about being hungry. And sexual addictions are not about being horny. This isn't what they're about. They're about this spiritual wound that the wounded inner child carries. Deep fears of abandonment. you suicidal if a relationship ends. You can't leave anything. You carry notes for general, you know, every time you move, you carry all this stuff with you because you can't let anything go out of fear of abandonment. Continual need to be admired. See, that's that narcissistic need. And guess what? If you didn't get that from your mama, guess one of the things you can do? You can make your child be the object of your narcissistic gratification. Alice Miller wrote probably the most important book that I've read in the last 30 years called The Drama of the Gifted Child about how narcissistically deprived parents farm and deform the emotional life of their children. Meaning by that, that if mother didn't get her narcissistic needs met, that is her needs for admiration, guess who she'll set up to admire her? Her children. And boy, she'll, she'll do it till she dies. She'll be calling you for the next 60 years. And let's have some respect for me. And, and a lot of us, some, some people had very devoted parents and didn't realize they were being used as their parents' narcissistic supplies. And that's the spiritual wound. Because you were not loved for the one you are. See, use is abuse. Whenever you're being used, you're being abused. A child cannot know he or she is being abused, being used. Child can't know it. Basically, a child can't know they're being abused. How do you know what abuse is? Who's teaching you about life? Who's modeling life for you? Your parents. So they've got all the knowledge. They know where Baskin Robbins is. What do you know? So if they say, I'm doing this for your own good, why would you argue with that? So one of the adult issues that happens, you're gullible, you swallow things whole. You, uh, it, one of the adult issues is that you have narcissistic problems. You have this continuous need to be admired, so you get in a relationship and you drive the person crazy. 
Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? How do you know you love me? How do you know you... And finally they're going, huh? No, I don't love you. I'm sick of you. <laughs> and, and so you can't understand why this person left you. Because they can't take it anymore. And uh, sexual narcissism. See, we're getting a lot of love addiction. You didn't get this primary bonding. See, the primal scene is a face. Gazing into a face. It's one of the reasons groups are so powerful, because there's lots of faces in groups. Motion manifests in the face. Manifests in the face. So when I sit in a group of people and look at faces, there's a power that happens. Like you're going to see this on some videotape in the show today. You're going to see what happens in a group where people just sit in a group and they tell each other certain affirmations. And, and the power of these affirmations is just awesome. How, how it can touch people, and how when you sit there with a group of people, it can bring up feelings in a way that nothing else can. Now, when you fall in love with somebody, guess what happens? You go back to primal gazing. You ever been around lovers? You know, you're sitting there talking to them, and they're, you know, they're staring at each other, and you're going, hey, hey, I'm here, I'm here, can you see me? Uh, and it's wonderful, see, and a lot of people really are into love addiction. Because it's this wonderful mood alteration. When you're in your love, you're out of your gourd. You're, you're oceanic. You, you, all the boundaries collapse. And, and you go back to this primal kind of oceanic oneness. You go back to infancy symbolic bonding, symbiotic bonding. You talk baby talk. <laughs> so love addiction, a lot of addiction, lost child that you weren't accepted, Sort of the message to you was, get lost, child. That you were never accepted for the very one you were. And you knew it early on. See, children need to know how to matter. A lot, some kids get it very early on that the way to matter around here is get lost. Play in your room, be quiet, don't make any noise. Be invisible. In therapy, when we work with lost kids, they're often invisible. I'll say, where's, where's Joe? He's right there in front of me. But somehow, they have so got it that the only way I can stay here, the only way I'm wanted is if I get lost. So it's a very, very powerful kind of abuse that happens to people who didn't get their infancy needs met. Now, what do we do? How do we go back and claim this infant if you didn't get those needs met, if you're identifying with some of these indexes of suspicion? One of the ways I do this, you saw, the, some of you saw this in the program on original pain. Maybe you didn't see it, but it was one of the programs uh, in this series where you saw powerful feelings being expressed. Well, I'm going to show you now some other ways to do this work, and we're going to start with a segment which is an age regression. Now, a lot of the contaminations of the wounded inner child are age regressions. When you're overreacting, when you're temper tantruming, when you're pouting, you're in age regressions. So don't let age regression scare you. Although when you see this work on here, you're just going to see a piece of it and there's some cautions I would make. Uh, if a person is in therapy, working with a therapist, I wouldn't encourage you to try this kind of work on your own if you don't have your therapist's permission. If you've been pronounced mentally ill, this would not be a good thing to be doing on your own without some kind of guidance. Uh, I would say if this work scares you in any way, just don't touch it. Uh, please don't touch it. Uh, the age regression is really something we do quite naturally. Milton Erickson used to say, we go in and out of trance all day. Anytime you're in concentration, you're in a trance. That is, you're going into a trance. The importance of age regression is that up to about six or seven, we don't remember anything because we were in another state of consciousness. We were magical. We were non-logical. We were egocentric. We lived with felt thought. It was Winnie the Pooh and Tigger too. And we were barn comrades of bird, beast, and tree, and unselfconscious as the bee. So, so we have to do exercises to get us back in touch, to access the inner child. And what you're going to see on this tape is part of a segment of me working with a group of people in Houston, the Center for Recovering Families, uh, doing an age regression where they're going back and they're touching the energy. Ronald Lang said, we're all in a post-hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. So we want to touch that because this part of you made major decisions about yourself. This child part of you made major decisions. 
And one of the values of working with the child is that you can change those decisions. So I want you to look at this piece now. Let's take a look at this. There was a time long, long ago, a once upon a time, when we were all there waiting to be born. You had everything you needed to have. In every way you were perfect. Get a feeling of it. Was this a happy time? Were you welcome to the world? And who was there for you? Or maybe who wasn't there? Just get a sense of what it felt like to be born into this family that you came into. And just let yourself feel whatever it is you feel. You're going to hear the things that you needed to hear from this group of supporting people who are here for you now. This little family that's here for you now, they're going to be telling you what you needed to hear. You may not have heard these things when you came into the world. And you needed to hear them. And you need to hear them now. That you are welcome. That you are loved for the very one that you are. That it's okay to be you. That you have all the time you need that your feelings, your sadness is okay and you can have it. Nobody's going to try to take it away from you. Your fear is okay. And your joy is okay. Now I have people move into small groups together and have one person sit in the center of the group and I use a set of affirmations that I first read in Pam Levin's book, Cycles of Power. I've adapted these for all the developmental stages. And I have people listen to these words that they needed to hear when they came into the world. These are what we call the infancy affirmations. They're words like, welcome to the world. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're a boy. I'm glad you're a girl. Your needs are okay with me. Uh, I'm here to take care of you. You won't have to take care of me. You'll have all the time that you need to take care of yourself. You'll have all the time you need to get your needs met. Uh, I enjoy holding you. I enjoy listening to you, being with you, looking at you. I've made a special place for you. Uh, and I play that to lullaby music. My choice is Stephen Halpern's music. People hear this music in the background. Uh, and, and they give each other these affirmations. Now, I want you to watch how powerful this is when they hear these words. Pam Levin did a study of people in a coma whose pulse rate changed when they heard these words. So let's look at it. I love you just the way you are.
are so glad you're here. We are so glad you're born. You're wonderful. You are so special. I'm so happy I had you. I'm glad you're a boy. You deserve to live. I'm glad you're here. We have a special place for you. People tell me over and over again in the workshops that they can't believe how those words touch them, that they didn't think they were going to have this kind of discharge. But you see, if we never heard those words, an infant can't hear them, but had the kinesthetic, the feeling affect of those words, then we have a hole in there. And when we touch that with these words, that discharge just comes naturally. See, how many of you really had parents that shared with you feelings? A dad, you could, you know what he felt. He told you what he felt, and you could bond with that. In my family, if there was a feeling, the alarm went off. <laughs> and they said, they, they, we, there's a feeling in the living room, get it! And everybody <laughs> rushed in there and thought it out. Uh, or, or, or we rescued it, which was count your blessings. Let's look on the bright. We've taught that's a good thing to do. That's what you do when people are sad. Or if you don't have something pleasant to say, Go to your room. Or if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Pat Carnes tells me that's from Thumper in Bambi. A whole generation raised on a cartoon rabbit. Uh, so, so these no talk, no feel rules, don't talk, don't express feelings, are very common in the families that we come out of. So this kind of sharing creates a bond of intimacy. So I have people share now after they've done the exercise. I have them share with each other how that was for them and talk about the feelings that they had. And that bonds the group together. So let's take a look at that now. When you talked about me being rocked and held, because my mother was always real nervous holding me. And when I was in the middle and you said that, I could really feel that. It felt so good. And I, I did, the second time around, I felt some anger when a male voice said something. And I don't know what that was about, but I did feel bad. It's okay. I, f I felt, uh, well, scared at first and distrustful. Like it wasn't, I couldn't quite accept it. And then I finally, about the middle, I started accepting it and taking it in and, and feeling the warmth of it experience and start to feel good. I'd like some more of that. <laughs> I was always told that I was unwanted and I was a mistake and I shouldn't have been born and, and I have that feeling that you know, right from the beginning I was just rejected and I think it's so hard, why it's so hard for me to get in touch with that child because that part of me wants to abandon her too. For me, I had love at that stage, I think, and attention from my family. But uh, my craziness happened after that, because my mother was an addict, a uh, food addict, and crazy, and a lot of the craziness came afterward. So, and I have a hard time getting in touch with my feelings. Really, she can blank them out, because that's... I don't remember anything from, from back then, but uh, just a sense of, at first it felt really good, and then I realized that I never heard, and then it hurt, and then 
fill in an old hole. I felt a lot of, uh, there was just some joy just to sit and soak it up. And just kind of feeling like a sponge that I need a lot of that talk. And uh, there was so very little of it when I was a baby. And uh, it's very painful. But to get past the pain and to, to just let those thoughts and feelings come in is wonderful. It, it never ceases to amaze me the depth of pain that people have. I've been all over the country now doing this workshop with people, and uh, I've gotten to the point I can't even walk through the sharings and listen to it because it is so painful. And I can't believe the level of pain that people are carrying. We, we had in that sharing a lost child told I was unwanted. I was a mistake, should not have been born. She, she shared how difficult it is for her to accept the child because she doesn't believe it. Uh, male voices, I don't trust them. Rhonda says, uh, uh, got my infancy needs met, Seymour says. So, so you could have gotten this developmental stage met. All the craziness started later. I numbed out. I learned how to blank my feelings out. And see, sometimes I just tell people in these groups, just pay attention to what's happening. You know, just, just see what's happening when you're in the group. When you start feeling this emotion, what do you do? How do you stop yourself? How do you numb out? Just knowing that is the beginning of healing. If I know how I do it, I can stop doing it. So it, it's enormously important. I, I never heard words like this. Barry, the guy at the end, with those tears coming down. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it felt soothing in some way, like it was filling an old hole up. And that's exactly the way I say it. There's a hole in our soul. It's like we've been soul murdered. It's you've been split. And so when you hear those affirming words, it's like accepting. It's like, here's a warm welcome. It's, it's a warm welcome. I'm wanted. I matter. See, every child needs to believe that I matter. Uh, when we look at the family system roles, we'll do that in the preschool developmental stage. It, it's like the way you learn to matter is with your role, the role that you, you have. And then, and finally, uh, at the end, Lynette says, let's embrace the pain. You have to embrace the pain. The only way out of the pain is to embrace it. You either work it out or you act it out. You can't heal what you can't feel. You pass it back or you pass it on. These are the slogans we use. So what I do is I have people reflect on this infancy process. We go through each one of the developmental stages, and we'll do that in in future programs. We'll look at other ways to access the child. But I'll have them listen which words touched you. Like, like you're, uh, you, you'll be amazed at how often uh, it's, it's when you hear, I'm glad you're a boy, or I'm glad you're a girl. That, that you knew your dad didn't want a girl, or you knew your mom didn't want a boy. And somehow you knew that kinesthetically. Or maybe it's when you hear a male voice, something happens, or a female voice. Uh, or, or sometimes you'll have a lot of energy, you'll say, ah, oh, this is just stupid. See, because you don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be tender. See, we hate vulnerability. We've hated vulnerability in this country. Uh, so we beat women and children. It's an ancient and pervasive tradition. The vulnerable ones, the old and the young. We beat up on gay people. Uh, it, it's, it's just terrible what we do to vulnerability. We don't want a president who would cry like Muskie on the campaign trail. He was history. We wouldn't want a president to show emotion. We'd want one that can act, uh, one that can, uh, you know, that can, can do impression management. Uh, uh, you know, that's a tragic, tragic footnote to our culture. So, so I have people realize, and in, in, in subsequent programs, we'll talk about how these infancy needs are recycled. Pamela Levin thinks every 13 years you go back into your infancy needs. When you start a new job, when you start a new life cycle, when you have children of your own, when you have an infant child, those infancy needs will come up again very, very powerfully. When somebody dies, when somebody dies that you love, 
Tennyson said, what am I? An infant crying in the night, an infant crying for the light, and with no language but a cry. When my daddy was dying, I, I, that's what that's just kept going through my head. And the doctors were telling me all this stuff that I couldn't understand, and I knew he was dying. And nobody could, you know, we were all powerless. What am I, an infant crying in the night? When, when people are grieving, they're like little children again. They can't think. They need help. They need us to be there for them. Not just call up and say, if there's anything I can do for me, call me. You can't think when you're grieving. So, so there's, there's a way that when we look at this whole infancy and we do this infancy exercise, we can really determine whether we got those needs met or not. Now, in the programs that I talk about championing the child, I'll talk about how to get these needs met, corrective experiences, what we can do if we didn't get these needs met. And there are things that we can do. Uh, you can get a friend, uh, you know, that, that, that you can commit in, in safety to to hold you, just to hold you. So, because you need tactile needs. You don't need to be talked to when your infancy needs are up. You need a friend who will feed you. Say, hey, Joe, come on over. I'm ready. I'm starting a new job tomorrow. So I know to come over and feed you. Uh, uh, so, so there's a number of things that we can do uh, if we didn't get these infancy needs met. Those of you who are lost kids, there's lots of things you can do. And we'll talk about that in subsequent programs. So what I want you to do now, if you will, is just close your eyes. I want you to experience something of that, that feeling. And just, just allow yourself to focus on your breathing. In that music you heard earlier, Fred Swartz has literally recorded the heartbeat of the mother as a child would experience it in the womb. Uh, so so just, just focus on your breathing. Become mindful of breathing. And just notice the air as it comes in and as it goes out. Just imagine what it would be like, and this is a leap of the imagination, that you were just a child, an infant child being held in your mother's arms. You were all nestled and warm in your mother's arms right now. But you could hear her heartbeat as you were held and cuddled. And you could hear these beautiful words. You, you, heard, you can hear right now as an infant, you can hear a voice saying, welcome to the world. I'm so glad you're here. I've been waiting for you. And I've prepared a very special place for you. I'm so glad you were born. I will not leave you no matter what. Your needs are okay with me. I am prepared to take care of you. I'm glad you're a girl. I'm glad you're a boy. I love you just the way you are. You'll have all the time you need to get your needs met. And now just be your grown-up self again. Take a deep breath and just let yourself feel how good that feels to be welcomed and open your eyes and just feel that good warm feeling of being welcomed. So we'll see you again next time when we talk about reclaiming our toddler self.